Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode, and I'm so excited. We have Mary Sheila Ganella, who is a holistic nutrition consultant and an educator, and she helps people who are suffering with high blood sugar, health, sleep issues, digestion problems, and she's also the author of the book, The Breakfast Report. So tell us a little bit, I've told a little bit, but how did you get started in this and and what caused you to write your book? Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I am so passionate about nutrition in general. And I, like so many people in the field, I really got inspired because of my own health journey. You know, I grew up as a child in the 70s. I was in a big family and I think my mom was the perfect target for just the more of the convenience processed foods that came out. So I kind of grew up in that way. And I grew up on a lot of antibiotics. And really, it was when I was in my uh, late teens when I was actually pretty sick. And I ended up getting my tonsils out when I was 19 years old. And I really had to rebuild and regain my health after that point. And I used food as my medicine. And I'm so grateful because I ended up moving. I live in Northern California and I moved up there and such a great farm and agricultural scene up there. And it just really opened my eyes to food being your medicine, whether it was food grown from the land on a farm or wild crafting my food. And I just really got into it and healed my body. And I wanted to really share that. I wanted to teach other people how to do the same thing. And I always knew I'd be a teacher and I was even a teacher for a minute in in the school setting. And then I kind of circled back around once I finished my education and just started using this as my vehicle. That's awesome. And I know that you do a blood sugar reset retreat that's Mm -hmm. coming up in October. So who is this retreat aimed at and what does it kind of look like? Yeah. So this is the second time I've done this retreat and uh, it's basically like blood sugar. The way that I approach health is through the lens of the hormonal system and that being all of your different endocrine glands and your, your pancreas and blood sugar is one of those glands. So it's really like a piece of my system and my formula that I work with with people. But blood sugar is huge. It really is the, the pinnacle and the kind of the health crisis of our time. And so much of that has to do with what we're eating, you know, how we're sleeping, how we're moving, how much stress is in our life. And so it is food, but it's so many other things. So I really teach people exactly you know, what happens when your blood sugar is high and low and why and how to really address that and fix that through the, you know, through the lens of the hormones, because, you know, if we think about blood sugar, there's insulin and insulin is a hormone. So we have to. I have to show you something real quick. Yeah. Um, So I went, I went to Whole Foods today and I found this it was, it was so cute, and I, I was like, you know what? She's coming on our show, and I'm going to show it to her. It's something I found. I, don't, I haven't really researched it too much, but it's called Smart Sweets Gummy Bears, and it's three grams of sugar per bag, and it, had, it has 90 calories, three grams of sugar, but 28 grams of fiber. Wow. I know. And here's the ingredients. It's prebiotic soluble fiber from tapioca, gelatin, chicory root fiber, citric acid, malic acid, fruit and vegetable juice, natural flavor, stevia, and carbona, carn, carnaba wax. Okay. So <clears throat> all the fiber that's in that is the is what we call the prebiotics. And that's the fiber that will feed your microbiome. That's the fiber that your bacteria eat. And so in that sense, you know, that's a good thing. So there's going to be some sugar there because they kind of feed off fibers and sugars. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. I just saw that. I was like, I got to show that to her is something I hadn't seen in a while. What will they think of next? I know. Well, let's get right into our questions. This is from Liz in Cooperstown. My mood swings have been out of control lately and I've been doing research trying to figure out what's going on because I don't have anything going on in my life that would justify this moodiness. I've been reading a lot about gut health and gut feelings and I'm intrigued. Do you believe that our gut truly affects our mood and how does this work? 
Yeah, the the answer to that is absolutely. <clears throat> um, sometimes if there is like a barrier in the gut or a breach in the gut lining and things can get out, that absolutely can affect our mood. And then, um, you know, the gut and the brain, the same embryonic tissue as we're developing are those, those two tissues, they just separate out and they're connected through the vagus nerve. And mm -hmm. anytime we have... A, digestive issues or mental health issues, we have to look at the gut first. Um, so they're absolutely connected. In fact, the, the really cool thing is that our brain weighs about three, three and a half pounds, and so does our microbiome, so does all of our bacteria. So there's so much synergy there. Um, I would say with a lot of moodiness is, you know, make sure you are feeding your microbiome with good fibrous foods. You just showed us that example, but you know, lots of fiber from vegetables is very helpful. And then adequate protein. Protein is the building block of our neurotransmitters. So what we eat and break down and then ends up feeding the brain. And, and a lot of the, the building blocks of our neurotransmitters, our feel-good hormones that help us to feel good, are, uh, are based off of protein. So healthy proteins and fats make a big difference there. Okay, awesome. This next one is from Mira in Eau Claire. You know, is WI Wisconsin? I think so. Okay, I think it's Wisconsin. I did well in school except for geography. <laughs> so these people send in their questions and I'm like, I've never heard of some of these places. It says, hey Chantel, I'm a recovering sugar addict and a mom of one. I want to know how to curb my sugar cravings and eat healthier in general, but I get hung up on the fact that I have oral allergy syndrome, which causes my body to be oversensitive to the pollen in most fresh fruits and veggies. I get an allergic reaction, including throat and tongue swelling. Common foods I can't have are apples, bananas, pears, peaches, plums, carrots, green beans, and celery. Help. Wow. That's a lot of stuff that a lot of really great healthy foods that she can't have. Yeah, definitely. My heart goes out to you, Mira. <clears throat> um, I would say that that's great. You're recovering from the sugar. And again, I'm going to come back to proteins being really good at helping you to, to get over that. And if those foods are fresh and it's the pollens, I wonder if, you know, she would do better cooking her foods. And a lot of times when we cook our food, making soups, stews, however you, you know, your method is, you're probably going to neutralize a lot of that, that stuff. And you're going to even make things a little bit more digestible. When you have been a sugar addict and you have a little one, you're probably under more stress. So when you cook your food, as opposed to just eating it raw, it's going to be more nourishing. You're going to be able to absorb and digest and assimilate a little bit more of the minerals and things in there. So I mean, I think that would be the first thing. And then anytime there's allergies like that, again, you kind of have to look at the gut and the, the, the balance of the microflora or the different bacteria that are in the gut. Um, and often even the histamines that are in food. So you probably even need to eat foods that are not necessarily leftovers, that are fresher, but cooked. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, and what's funny is I actually know a lot about this. I don't have this problem, but my trainer... Uh, at the gym has this exact issue because I what I you know one of the things I'm really big on is I always ask everyone what do you eat for breakfast what do you eat for lunch what do you eat for dinner you know and so like she would tell me well I, you know I can't have this and I can't have that and I can't have this other and so basically what it is is that you know, people with these triggers, they either have a trigger to birch pollen, grass pollen, or ragweed pollen. So depending on which one they do, so if it's, you know, if it's an apple or almond or celery or carrots or cherries, um, those people have a problem with birch pollen, while somebody else who, um, you know, has grass pollen, it's, it might be melons or oranges. And basically what happens is every time they eat something, they get an itchy mouth or a scratchy throat or their lips swell up or uh, they just start getting, you know, real itchy and they have some things going on in their mouth. And just like you said, with her, as long as she cooks them, she doesn't really have a problem. If she, so like with the apples, what she says she does, she'll take apples, she'll uh, peel them and then put them in the oven, put like a ton of cinnamon, 
And then she, what she does is like makes it like an apple pie with no crust, you nice. know? And just trying to find ways that you can just get excited about eating some of this stuff. Hopefully, most of the people that I know that have this syndrome, once they cook it, like you said, they don't have a problem with it. So that would be my suggestion as well. Okay, Angel in Harrisonburg. She says, I cannot shake this funk I'm feeling. I haven't felt like myself in months. I'm tired all the time, even though I'm getting the same amount of sleep I've always got. I've been following your 80-20 principle and eating clean 80% of the time and have been keeping an eye on my gluten and dairy. I had my doctor run a panel and he said everything looked completely normal. What could be wrong? Well, <clears throat> to me that sounds a lot like the adrenals, um, which is I call the seat of your vitality. And again, another part of the hormonal system that just can be, can be nourished. So it's hard to just answer that question without me asking more questions to her, but I would say, you know, what are you having for breakfast? Um, you know, kind of, I'm like you, what, what's your breakfast? What's your lunch? What's your dinner? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to know how well you're nourishing yourself. And there could be an underlying, some kind of underlying, um, you know, infection or something that's sort of robbing your adrenals and making them busy doing other things. Um, so, I would work, do what you can to boost your immune system. So that could be um, immune, uh, things like making a good broth, whether it's a bone broth or a vegetable broth and adding immune herbs like astragalus and um, ginger root and garlic. And uh, there's other kinds of herbs. They might be harder to get in different areas of the country, but um, uh, medicinal mushrooms are excellent for boosting the immune system. Turmeric is also a great one. So anything you can do around boosting your immunity can really support the body. And whatever you know, there's something underlying that the body's trying to fight. If all of a sudden you get into this funk, um, that that can play a big role there. And that, the other thing I'll say is just hydration. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure we're getting enough hydration to really be able to flush everything out. Mm, that's really good. So um, I just, I recently just was like so tired I couldn't even get up out of bed. Like I was just like, and I really have a lot of energy. And so there's a few things that I've done to really kind of help me get going. And I don't want to go over it right now, but if you go to ChantelRayWay.com slash tired, um, I have a great video on there and you can look at it for what I am what I did to help me with just being so tired all the time but we've got a bunch of questions so I want to keep going on okay Brenna in Massachusetts she says I'm so trying to get I'm trying hard to get more sleep because everyone tells me how important it is when I'm trying to lose weight but I just can't seem to get myself to go to bed early I try to get in bed around 9 and start staring at my ceiling until at least 11 or almost midnight sleeping is not an option for me so I need to figure out how to make myself go to bed earlier and sleep all the way through the night. Oh, she said sleeping in, sorry. I was like, wait, sleeping in is not an option for me. So I need to figure out how to make myself go to bed earlier. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, you might even have to start just trying to go to sleep a little bit earlier than what than the 11 or 12 midnight. And getting to bed at nine is great. If you can read, I would say get off all electronics at you know, nine o'clock, eight o'clock to keep the brain getting more calm. Mm -hmm. Always have a starch with dinner that will help to calm the nervous system. So that's like, whether it's a root vegetable or a bean or a grain or something um, that will, and maybe even a vegetarian dinner can really help calm everything down. Um, breathing exercises are key as well. And sometimes again, the adrenals could be totally out of rhythm. Um, one thing I can safely say there, I use amino acids to help people with their sleep and sometimes with cravings and things like that. Some of them have contraindications, but one that's really great at calming the brain down at night is called GABA, G-A-B-A. -A. You can mm. take between 100 and 500 milligrams. The only real contraindication is if you have real low blood pressure. Um, so that's a good one. You can get it. It's easy to get at any market or online and it, what it does is it just starts to calm the stress response, calm down from the brain down. Cause sometimes we can't get to sleep because our mind is kind of wired. 
the adrenals again have this rhythm where they're high in the morning and low in the afternoon and evening and again sometimes people could have the rhythm is off and it makes it really hard to go to sleep hard to wake up like you were saying it was hard for you to get up in the morning and then sometimes it'd be hard to go to sleep so GABA is really helpful getting off electronics early and adding a starch for dinner are probably three just kind of basic you know things that Great. you can start with yeah Okay, great. Michelle in Hampton, she said, I read online that being outside and getting sunlight will help my gut health, which I think is crazy. I've had no idea how the two are connected, but I'm wondering how I can implement this. How much time do I need to spend outside to enjoy the benefits of sunlight and fresh air? And do you have any tips to squeeze this in to my day? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that you get from going outside and getting sunshine is vitamin D. <clears throat> On the lining of the, of the gut, if you think about the lining, I always say it's like plumbing, right? We don't want to have any leaks in our plumbing. The, if you then, maybe a slightly different metaphor, if, if along the lining you have guards that are protecting and not letting anything that's too big and can be irritating to the rest of the body in, that's vitamin D. They are the guards so having enough vitamin D means you have a lot of guards lining your gut wall and not letting stuff out. And that is gonna help heal your gut. The other thing is when we go outside and we breathe the fresh air and get the benefits that being outside gives to us, that also is gonna calm our cortisol. When our cortisol is continuously high, that also will thin the lining of the gut. So if we can calm our cortisol, thin the lining of the gut, I'm sorry, and, and start to strengthen and heal the lining of the gut, that is really beneficial. Vitamin D, we can get in sunlight. There are going to be certain altitudes and times a year where we're not going to be able to get as much. But I would say that, you know, even so sometimes in the wintertime, you might have to supplement with vitamin D. But again, I would schedule this. It's always great to schedule a habit around a habit you already have. So around mealtime, if you could calm your cortisol, get yourself into parasympathetic nervous system, that will enhance your digestion. That's gonna put you into rest and digest. So I would, like, if you wanna have a new habit around getting outside, I would stack it around, probably around your meal times. Take your meal, go for a walk, either before or after, and, and allow yourself to take in, you know, the natural beauty outside. That's great. Hey guys, I'm so excited that my new book, Waste Away, The Chantel Rayway, is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and pretty much anywhere you can find books. But we also have the audiobook, the ebook, and my new recipe book that you can download all the recipes that I love that I make, and it's super cheap. It's all my favorites. Anyway, if you have a minute to write a review on Amazon, I would be ever grateful. Holly in Atlanta, I've recently been diagnosed with adrenal fatigue and I'm trying to figure out how to get a handle on it the natural way. What are some foods that I should be focused on eating and what are the foods that I should be avoiding? Are there any natural supplements or vitamins that you recommend I take? Holly in Atlanta. Yeah, so Holly, I would definitely, um, the foods that and, and nutrients that are really beneficial to the adrenals are foods that are high in vitamin C. So I like to call our adrenals, they are our first responders. So every stress, even if it's just being cold or being hungry, that the body goes through, the adrenal glands are there to support us with that stress. So if we could, um, so anything, any stresses you can minimize is gonna be golden for your adrenal glands. And then the adrenals love vitamin C. So when, when we feel sick and we think, oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling well, I need to take vitamin C, 90% of the vitamin C that you take in goes to the adrenal glands. So that's a key nutrient for the adrenals. More stress you're under, you could take more. You could take up you know, between 500 and 2,000 milligrams daily. B vitamins are key for the uh, adrenals and key for producing energy in the body. So if your energy is low- What are your thoughts on B12 shots? So we've had some people say, you know, I think they're good. We've had some people say the problem with it is if you take it and then your body is, you know, you're, you're basically teaching your body, hey, I don't need to produce as much because I'm bringing in this extra shot. What's your opinion on that? I, I'm more of a fan that if you need it, I think it's a great thing. Here's the thing with B12 is that we, we, we have to first grab the B12 in the stomach, and then we have to bring it down to the fall further on down in the small intestine and absorb it. 
if there's inflammation in that area, which often people will have if they have allergies, whether they know for them or not to grains or gluten or anything like that, and there's more inflammation, they're not going to be able to absorb it. As we age, we produce less stomach acid that helps in that grabbing of the B12. So a lot of people are deficient. B12 is, can, you know, for a lot of, especially elders, if somebody has B12 deficiency, they could be, have less cognitive function, have less balance issues. Sometimes it can mimic dementia. So it's a pretty essential nutrient. I don't know. I think things that we really need, if we need them, we're going to use them. If we don't need them, we're going to not, you know, we'll probably excrete them out. And in the case of B12, it's a water soluble vitamin. We'll just excrete it out. So, so with speaking of, um, I, I have some props here. So I brought some, um, I brought some HC, uh, yeah. HCL, HCL with pepsin. Um, so what is your opinion on someone taking this? Because I agree, every person that I have known that have had gut issues, that have thyroid issues, that have on and on and on and on, you know, the more I'm reading, the more I'm researching, it's all about low stomach acid. So what is your opinion, number one, on this? And what is your opinion on alkaline water? Okay. So I, when I work with people, I, I often look at, okay, let's make sure and see how your digestion is working and let's optimize that first. Because ideally, we should have everything working in good order and we should be able to digest and break everything down. The stomach is the place in the body where our food is cooking. That's it's. I, I like to think of it as the pot is where we cook our oh, food. I like that. Yeah, we liquefy it. It's a kind of sour place. It gets really hot, and then it. And if we and this is where we unfold and denature, or not denature, but we unfold our proteins to make it so that we can break down those amino acids. And if we don't have a lot of stomach fire, then our proteins are not going to get absorbed as well in the small intestine. And the other thing the stomach does is the stomach is the, it, it's also part of our immune system. We have this st strong fire that can put pathogens out right there in the stomach. So we can eat something that is like, whoa, this is not okay for the body. And boom, we'll put it out in the stomach with that fire. There's, so if you think of the stomach as the pot that's cooking our food, there's lots of ways that we can put that fire out. One of them is we drink a whole bunch of liquid at a meal. All of a sudden we start drinking all this water. That's yeah. going to put your fire out. Oh, I or, love that analogy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is so good. Yeah, well, that's exactly. So each part of the digestive tract can be related to a flavor and a, you know, and then it's action. What does it do? So, you know, so many people have things like SIBO and which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or IBS, and they've got lots of bloating and gas or constipation. And a lot of times we have to back it up and say, How's your stomach fire? Do you have a lot of fire or do you need to stoke that fire? Spices help to stoke the, stoke the so fire. So would you say that this would be something that would, the HCL would be um, Absolutely. It's something that, our body already made. that's like putting wood on the fire, right? Exactly. Now, what exactly. is your opinion on something like, just like uh, the yeah. papaya enzyme? Yeah, so the papaya enzyme is going to help us break down proteins if we eat them with, if we take them with our food. When there's food in our stomach, it's going to support the body in breaking them down. If you take proteolytic enzymes away from food, you are going, they're going to actually, and your stomach is empty, they're going to be able to get out of the stomach pretty quickly and into the bloodstream. And I like to call them little Pac-Men at that point. They're just like moving through the blood, breaking up things like inflammation and, you know, protein, because most in anytime the immune system tr it fires, that's uh, inflammation and the immune system is a protein system in the body. So if there's excess inflammation, those little Pac-Man are going to come down and kind of start breaking things up. So they're great for inflammation and they're great for breaking down the foods that we're eating. And if you're really work using it to break down all of their foods, then you would take your digestive enzyme with your meal and you would take not just the papaya, the proteolytic, but you could also take a complete one that also would break down the amylase and the carbohydrates, and then it would have lipase and help break down the fats. Gotcha. Now these digestive enzymes, would you, do you have a brand that you love? Um, and would you say, are you taking it with, you know, lunch and dinner? Or do you taking it twice a day? What would you be recommending? 
and yeah, and, it, and, it, and it, clarify it. with what you were saying as far as taking it with your meal or without your meal. For Claire. sure. So oftentimes when I recommend digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid, I recommend them as two separate things, sort of how you have them now. So I say, okay, take the hydrochloric acid. And usually what I say is take one with a medium sized meal, maybe a few bites in. And then the next time you have a meal of a similar size, take two and you, you sort of dose it until you feel a little bit of a warmth in the belly. When you feel that warmth and let's say you took three and you're like, whoa, I feel a little warmth. Then the next time just take two. And that is your, your number for each meal. It doesn't necessarily have to be forever. It's a little bit more about taking it until maybe you get, you get some of that fire back on your own. As far as digestive enzymes, if you're taking them, especially if you have digestive symptoms, like maybe you have acid reflux, maybe you have whatever, you know, a lot of bloating and you find relief from it, then you might as well take it with each meal. That's totally fine to take it with each meal. Um, you know, and, and you so we food. need to talk about that too, because that is a common misconception is people think I have, you know, acid reflux and then they take an antacid, which yes. makes it worse, correct? Yes. And they think it's making it better. So talk about that for just a second. Yeah, the majority of, of acid reflux is not too much hydrochloric acid. It's often not enough. And it is often maybe we're eating too much. Maybe the combination of foods that we're eating is not, you know, designed for our bodies to digest them. Maybe we're eating something that we're allergic to. And so, and then maybe the stomach isn't having enough of it. Its stomach is, it chemically breaks down with some of the things we were talking about, the acids, and then it also mechanically churns our food. It sits there too long, it starts to come up. Another really important thing that to note is, and I've read some studies on this, is the more we breathe deeply, a lot of us are shallow breathing even while we're eating or we're multitasking while we're eating and we don't, and, and that, that breath kind of massages and helps things to move along. Mm, so I didn't know that. Oh my yeah, gosh, I'm like, going to have to tell all my friends. <laughs> make sure I inhale, make sure I exhale. Friends, listen to this. Make sure I'm doing that while I'm eating. Now, let me ask you this about the HCL. We have had different people on the show. They've talked about different things. Do you, some people have said they like the HCL with pepsin. Some people say, no, I don't, I like the HCL, but not with the pepsin. Can you talk about that? Um, you know, I think they're both, they both have their place. I, I mean, they're both a similar action. So we're just, it's basically like, are we just going to give the, the body one part of the fire or couple of parts of the fire that we already produce. So if you're going to do it, I think sometimes it's good to do the HCL with the pepsin. It's sort of like a B vitamin. Don't just take one, take, take them all because there's a synergy in all of them. So then you're sort of giving the body equal amounts of what it already is going to be producing. Okay, perfect. Catherine in South Carolina says, I'm working hard to regulate my blood sugar naturally, and I'm focusing on eating foods with a low glycemic index. What are some of the best things that I should be eating? Also, do you think buying organic makes a big difference? Yeah, good question. So great job on working on your blood sugar. Um, you know, every time we're eating processed foods, and I'm sure you might know this already, but that's where we're gonna have the higher glycemic um, foods. So when you're eating carbohydrates that have sugars, those are basically all of our root vegetables, all of our grains, all of our beans, and uh, like winter squash. And then of course, anything that can be processed from that. So when it comes to eating low glycemic, we have to look at the quality and we also have to look at the quantity. The quality is eating the more complex and whole that they are, the lower glycemic, because it takes a while for us to break, to get access to those sugars um, from the, like a whole bean, those sugars are all bound up by the fiber and it's like our chewing, our stomach acid, our enzymes to break those apart. Soon as and we speaking of fiber, how much, how much fiber do you suggest that people are, are taking per day? And, and are you really kind of mentally kind of looking like, you know, I took this much fiber, this much fiber, so forth. Yeah, you know, fiber should be, the RDA is about 25 
uh, milligrams or grams. And I like to say, you know, between 30 to 50 ultimately. And sometimes if people have real low fiber, they have to bring it up a little bit slower so that they feel, don't feel uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, mo usually a serving size of, you know, a vegetable when you eat a vegetable or a fruit or nuts and seeds generally tend to be around five grams. So you can start to calculate it. If you're getting, you know, three to four servings of good vegetables or maybe, be you know, a bean or something, then you can start to see how many grams of fiber you're getting. And so if you aim for anywhere between 15, you know, I don't know, maybe long, at least 15 at each meal, you're right in the sweet spot. Well, here's, this is the other thing is that, you know, one of my good friends came to me and she, she said, everyone knows I'm, I'm not a good pooper. So, um, I really struggle with it. And so like when they're constipated, it's funny cause they're like, oh my gosh, Chantel, guess what? I'm constipated. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, yeah, like, like that, you know, they want someone to sympathize with them. And so she said, you know, I've been kind of changing up my diet. I'm trying to do this. And she's like, I feel like I'm getting a lot of fiber. And she's like, but I'm just having a hard time pooping. And I said, I said, let me stop you right there. Cause if you were really getting the amount of fiber that you needed, then you wouldn't be having a trouble pooping. So let's really dissect this and let's figure out how much fiber you are getting. And I said, okay, so let's discuss everything you ate today. And she had one of my, I have this low sugar anti-cancer smoothie recipe. Um, we'll put that in the show notes, guys. I'm telling you, this anti-cancer uh, low, uh, low sugar smoothie has really transformed my health. And I've had so many people who write in and they're like, oh my gosh, this smoothie has made me feel so much better. So we have that video. Um, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, or go to ChantelRayWay.com. It's right there on the top. But anyway, so we went through. She's like, I had that. I had this. I had this. And I, I just started calculating how much fiber. And I was like, I told her, I said, I think she had got like 18 or 20 grams of fiber for the day. And I was like, that's not enough. Yeah. So um, I really loved what you said. I, I agree. I say somewhere between 30 to 50 grams of fiber is, is great if you, if you can get it. Yeah. And let me just add this in as another, just a couple other curious things around constipation. Sometimes constipation can be a, uh, because of low thyroid function. It is. And that's a big thing. And my thyroid, I'm always having issues with my thyroid. So that's yeah. definitely yeah. an issue. Yeah. And then just to back up, um, just with that last question, um, which you also asked about, um, uh, sorry, what did she ask about? Oh, about organic. Yes. Yeah. So just to say, you know, I, I truly do believe that organic does matter. And a big part of why it does matter is that all the uh, pesticides and things that can be in non-organic foods, they are actually, they mimic estrogens in the body. So it's a lot more estrogen that the body has to process and get rid of. And that can contribute to estrogen dominance, which, you know, is a big part around, you just mentioned cancer, just around hormonal cancers for both men and women. Because even the majority of, of men's cancers, about 50% of men's cancers are estrogen dominant. So, mm -hmm. so that just takes on more of a total load of hormones that the body has to process and get out. Good. Okay. So, um, and, and just for you, what supplements are you taking um, like, is there something that you're taking every day? You're like, I don't, I don't live without this. And is there a certain brand that you love? Yeah. So I'm not the best supplement taker all the time. I do love taking enzymes and I do love, I do take hydrochloric acid quite often. Um, I, I go on and off with probiotics, but I do um, eat a lot of fermented foods and I make a lot of fermented foods. So I feel pretty good with just even getting them in my food. Um, and then I am a big fan of B vitamins for energy production and all the jobs that they do. I'm also a huge fan of magnesium. Um, I love magnesium calm. It's um, by, um, by yeah. Natural, natural Vitality. Um, that I love just even sometimes putting that in my water, just not enough where I feel, you know, cause too much can make you have really loose stools. So I don't go that far with it, but I just like to have that in my, in my water. Yeah. And I think taking a good multi is a good idea, um, as well. 
I'm not, I, you know, I, I always think food first. We have to get the right nutrients in with our, with our food. I agree because you can get, I, I feel like at one point I got completely, completely out of control with supplements because, you yeah. know, because I'm doing so much research and I have all these guests come on the show and say so like someone would be like, oh, well, I can't live without this supplement, right? So I'm like, oh, I'm taking that and I'm taking this and then I'm taking this and it's like your liver can't handle but so many different supplements that you're taking it. So yeah, exactly. I know. And, and then the one thing, so, so I don't take a whole lot of stuff, but I really focus, I am, you know, I am into my food big time. But one thing I do use is, and I, I mentioned this a little bit is I use amino acids, which are like the building blocks of our protein. And I use them for, you know, if I'm having a hard time sleeping or if I am, you know, or if people are moody or so do you just take the amino acids in pill form or is that through your protein powder? So I do that through pill form. And then when I, you know, and then that's why I'm such a big advocate of getting enough protein throughout the day. It really helps to balance the body. So yeah, things like 5-HTP or tryptophan or GABA um, or tyrosine, just, you know, as kind of as needed. And that's pretty much, you know, a little bit like my medicine cabinet. But ultimately, you know, the food is, is key. Okay, perfect. And then Rachel in Columbia says, I've recently started making smoothies in the morning and trying to squeeze in as much green stuff in there as I can. A friend recommended buying frozen organic spinach because it's cheaper than fresh spinach and it makes the smoothies cold and icy, which I love. I'm just curious if frozen spinach has all the same properties as fresh spinach, is there any difference? So when we get frozen vegetables, <clears throat> usually they're frozen right from fresh and they're usually in the height of their harvest. So frozen is actually a really good viable option. It's probably the one step down from fresh. Um, so it's a great way to still get, make sure a lot of the nutrients are intact. So yes, that's a great way. I will do a word of caution though. Spinach is very high in oxalates. It's a very high oxalate green. Oxalates can start to build up and they can build up in the kidneys. And sometimes people, I know so many people, even a doctor friend of mine who got really on the green smoothie train and ended up with kidney stones. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful with too much, especially if it's the same every day. So I think it's good to mix up our greens. Um, you can do, sometimes you can even do green powders, which probably are lower. You can also do things like kale, um, which are lower, but spinach and chard are really high in oxalates and they can eventually, like oxalates are sharp and the body can always break them down and, the, and our calcium is bound to them. So sometimes it's even hard to get the minerals. Cooking them lowers it. I, I know some people that really love their green smoothie and they'll even saute or steam their greens and then throw them into their smoothies. Mm -hmm. So it's just a word of caution on doing it every single day. I'd say maybe mix it up a little bit. And I think that's good for the body to mix it up anyways. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, as far as for, for me, I, we've had different people talk about the fresh versus frozen. And I think that the question is, is that, you know, really like how long has it been frozen for, first of all, you know, yeah. is it organic? And, you know, a lot of times these things can be stored for up to 12 months, you know, before being sold. So I would say that for me, just because I don't know, like, how long has it been since it's, you know, been frozen, one of the things I do is I just buy fresh. Um, and I just, for my smoothies, I buy it fresh and then just stick it in the freezer because I agree it's so much better when it's frozen. And I put it in little baggies and then I have everything all ready. And so it just, for me, you know, I don't know, for me in my brain, I'm thinking it, it has the most amount of nutrients once, you know, as far as from the time it was picked to the time that I get it. So I don't, you know, no one knows how long, you know, it's been frozen for. So I agree. I think it's not a huge, huge difference. Um, but if I can, 
I do like to buy it fresh and then just stick it in the freezer. So then I, I personally know how long it's been frozen and then I'm getting the best of both worlds, you know? Yeah, and sometimes you can find those things that you love on sale and you can then buy yeah. a whole lot of it, freeze yes. it. Freeze it. Yeah. yeah, I love that. That's a great idea. All right, last question. This is from Kate in New York. I've always heard that weight loss is 90% what you eat and that exercise isn't as important, but I want to start moving and trying to kick my weight loss up a notch. I work a full-time job and have two kids, so I don't have a ton of time, but I'm committed to carving out at least 30 minutes a couple times a week. What is the best exercise I can do to maximize this small amount of time? Yes. So I think moving and exercising is really important and um, it'll really jumpstart and, and sort of quantum leap your efforts that you're making with your food. And with not a whole lot of time, the cool thing is we can do is sort of like the intermittent fasting, we could do small, short bursts of exercise um, that will really help the body's metabolism to get stimulated. So sometimes for my clients that are super busy, I see if they can do, you know, a couple minutes here and there, even a couple minutes in the morning, you could do two minutes of really high intensity. That'll also get your blood sugar down. That'll get your insulin down. Um, well, I mean, one. she says she has two kids. So to me, I mean, yeah. walking, I would take those kids for a walk every single day and then yeah. boom, you could do that every single day you could be taking those kids on a walk for an hour you know and then you're spending time with them getting them out getting some vitamin d you know and you know unless obviously you know the weather's too you know raining or whatever but for the most part whatever days it's it's nice to get out there and walk and you could do a little, you know, when you guys are all home, you could do a little dance party and throw the music. Oh my gosh, that's such a good idea. Well, you know what's so funny? If you go look at my Facebook right now, my husband and I did a dance party and I videoed him and then he videoed me and then we were kind of like doing it. It was hysterical. I'm like in my pajamas and he's in his and it was so funny. We actually posted it. I was so mad at him for posting. I had like no makeup on and pajamas and he's like, videoing me but I kind of deserved it because I was videoing him because it was so cute but that's a great idea that's what we did yeah, last yeah. night and you know again sandwich in when you can exercise you work full-time but you get a lunch or you get a break can you just go for walks you mm -hmm. know when you have those times and just getting the body to move because once you're doing so much more than you know when you're exercising you're detoxifying you know you're you, there, I mean, there's so many benefits. And plus, we just, we do need to keep moving. We're meant to move. The less we move, the less we're going to continue to move yes. as we age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mary Sheila, we're done with our questions. And it was just such a pleasure to have you on. Will you tell everyone your website if they want to buy your book, The, the Breakfast Report, or get more information about your blood sugar reset retreat? Tell them what's your website. Yeah, so my website is occidentalnutrition.com. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you want me to spell that, but I can put it. In, I can put it in the okay, show notes. Put it in there, I'll put perfect. it in the show notes. Yeah, and and basically, you know, I I re my goal is and what I do is I help health conscious people who are really tired of whatever health issues they have mm. um, to uh, to go deeper than weight loss because maybe they know it's because of their food or their stress levels and they can go deeper than weight loss and reclaim their health so they can look and feel their best. And I have my blood sugar reset is, you know, coming up and I also have an online program that I'm launching as well too, that they can learn about, but it's called deeper than weight loss. And it's really my approach to understanding and learning how to navigate your, your entire team of metabolic hormones. And I like to call them your first responders. So you can really, you know, it, it helps you once you get a handle on that and your hormones come in, it, puts, it makes everything really easy in your life. And it's very preventative to everything from, you know, cancer to diabetes to thyroid issues to autoimmune to brain health. Everything is kind of all wrapped up in there. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure having you. And if you want a question that you want answered, go to questions at ChantelRayWay.com and we'll see you next time. Bye.